Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Ahmed Shamsi, and this is my talk on how Muslims disposed of books. Well, how did they dispose of books? Well, is that a question that's interesting? How do we dispose of books? How do you guys dispose of books? You, do you ever dispose of books? Try not to. Okay, there's a hoarder on the right. Anybody? Recycling. Recycling. Okay. So, so it gets like pulped and then remade into. Yeah. Yeah. Anybody else? No? Donating. Right, donating. That's a that's a good. Well, what do you do with like private papers, like letters? What do you do with those? Okay, yeah. What about the valuable ones? <laughs> um, well, I mean, you know, I guess you would keep them, maybe, but, you know, what, what are your kids going to do with them? If you don't kids, what happens with them afterwards? These are questions one, one has to answer. One has to answer, particularly in the world in which there's more and more written material, right? Every day there's this dread of, the post and what the post is going to bring and most of it is going to go immediately into the recycling. <clears throat> this was not such a big deal in the pre-modern world, uh, but still um, we have significant production of books in the Islamic world since the 8th century. Uh, paper has been mass produced. There has been a, a significant book culture, millions of books written, produced, um, we don't know how many survive until today, at least 600,000, that's the most conservative estimate of the pre-modern period. But what did people in the pre-modern period do with papers that um, they couldn't use anymore? Well, uh, there are uh, different ways. Um, this is, uh, the, the, the first slide I'm going to show you here has nothing to do with the Middle East. This is a picture from a, a, a peasant museum in Germany. <clears throat> but you can find this in, in, in peasant museums all around uh, Europe, uh, these um, old fashioned toilets, and then you have old newspapers um, that are uh, there for the taking. So that's a way of, of disposing of, of in, in, this case, in this case, printed material. Uh, but I would assume you probably don't, you wouldn't use, let's say, personal letters that you find valuable for that kind of purpose. And um, different cultures, different civilizations assign particular values to written uh, material. Uh, in order to be able to do this, there's a certain kind of profaneness that you, in which you use these written materials, right? And, uh, this is something that's not necessarily uh, universal. So um, um, when you go to Cairo, uh, into the Ben Ezra uh, synagogue in Cairo, we'll find that uh, in the 19th century, hundreds of thousands of fragments of writing were discovered um, that the Jewish community had stored there. And this is uh, a phenomenon that um, is um, definitely present uh, among Jews. It's also present among Muslims of assigning a particular value of sacredness to written uh, material. Uh, it doesn't necessarily have to be scripture. It doesn't have to be um, scripture, but even the idea of something written, particularly in your language, like in the language in which your scripture was written, that this is something that you do not, you don't, you don't throw in the trash. You don't want to disrespect. Um, so this discovery was a, a major window into Middle Eastern society because it preserved all kind of stuff that we otherwise don't have preserved. The kind of very day-to-day -day materials, like private letters. And, you know, we've been able to, well, not we, um, uh, scholars before us have been able to reconstruct 
trade routes, um, you know, that went all the way between Spain and India uh, in the, you know, in the 11th century, in the 12th century, in the 13th century. Uh, you know, just today I read from, from this uh, Geniza collection a small, um, like, a, uh, like a degree that you got when you were a, a physician uh, f in order to allow you to, to practice uh, medicine. Um, and this material then was um, was uh, uh, taken out of the synagogue. It was spread all over the world, particularly in Cambridge. Most of the material uh, is today, um, but uh, it is really in all kinds of places in the United States. It's primarily in Princeton. And these are the kind of um, documents that you find there. So they're not just uh, materials produced by the Jewish community in the sense of uh, you know, written in Hebrew or in, in, in Judeo-Arabic. Uh, Judeo-Arabic is basically Hebrew written in Arabic letters. Um, but uh, so, you know, you have dip, you know, on the on the on the right hand. Yeah, also on, on your right hand side, you have a, an Arabic document with um, if I remember correctly, uh, Hebrew in. So this was an Arabic document that was discarded uh, by a government chancellery and then was taken up by uh, a Jewish member of the Egyptian society and used as scrap paper. So you wrote in the between the lines. Uh, this is a very, uh, you can see a very informal note in the middle and on the uh, left hand side, uh, damage, is it, I don't know, is it water damage, fire? I think it's water damage, uh, water damage document. Um, now, so th th these were documents that were kept in the synagogue uh, because they wouldn't be thrown away and they, they were, they accumulated over a period of, of a thousand years. Um, you still have Guineas today, they're not as attractive as... Um, uh, as the old ones, this this looks a little bit like a like a recycling container, right? Um, <clears throat> just that it's it's not going to be recycled. Recycled, it's going to be permanently stored um, later on. All right. Now, that short excursion was about about uh, the the usage of of written materials by uh, Middle Eastern Jewish community. Now, when we go back to the question of the the uh, the term Geniza, and you know, when you hear the word etymology, you immediately want to, I guess, escape. Uh, I hope that's not the case, but uh, it's interesting to look at where this word actually comes from, and uh, it's pretty sure uh, that it comes from a, originally from a Persian word, Ganza, which, mean, which means treasure, and that's how the meaning of the word Geniza has generally been understood, i.e., uh, there is, um, this is some sort of treasure trove, like a a place where a tre treasure chest where you keep written materials. Um, now, the issue is that um, that's how it's always explained, how the word Geniza is explained. But then when scholars and, you know, uh, Boytein and, and, uh, and Schechter, they're the two great Geniza scholars, when they talk about what the meaning of this is, they very often use an analogy of burial, i.e. Um, these texts have a life cycle. Uh, they were born, they were produced, and they were used, and then they couldn't be used anymore, and then they had to be laid to rest, right? the way that a corpse is laid to rest. However, that's never used as a kind of etymology. That's never used as an explanation why this phenomenon actually is called a geniza. And here at the very uh, uh, bottom, there's a, a note of caution by Marinoso, who wrote about this, is saying, well, this idea that, that uh, that what a Geniza is, is basically a burial place. In pre-modern Jewish thought, we don't actually have this uh, discussed. I'll come back to this later on. Now, we have um, phenomena similar to uh, the, the Cairo uh, Jewish Geniza in uh, Muslim societies as well. So, for example, the Grand Mosque in Sana'a in Yemen, um, during the renovation in 1972, they found um, uh, a large cache of, of documents, and some of the oldest surviving document, uh, uh, fragments of the Quran actually were found in this occasion. Um, we have uh, a second one. This is from the Umayyad Mosque in Damascus. It's a beautiful place. Not possible to go there these days, but it is an absolutely beautiful place. And there's this strange structure in the middle of it, um, Generally, people explain to explain it as as having been used as a 
um, as a treasure, literally as treasury, as the treasury of the United States in the in the early period. But in later centuries, this was used as a place where all documents were stored, and um, that was the case until World War II, until um, Allied troops uh, were nearing Damascus when the Ottomans then removed most of this material to Istanbul, where it's stored today, and in fact hasn't really been studied. Um, uh, it's in the part part of the. Uh, Islamic Museum in Istanbul. So there's only been very few studies uh, undertaken of this. There's this one volume there, and we have a small fragment that is, in fact, still uh, kept in Syria. But we, we clearly have an idea that, that such practices were also present in Muslim societies. So what did pre-modern Muslims actually say about the topic? The earliest discussion that I've found is from a... Um, uh, from a Muslim scholar called Ma'mar ibn Rashid, who died in the 8th century, who has in his writing uh, three chapters, uh, or, sorry, one chapter with three reports uh, about, uh, so the chapter is called um, about the burning of written material. And uh, he has two anecdotes, one of them, um, uh, two of them uh, about two early Muslim figures who burned written material. That's their way of getting rid of uh, written material. And one of them who did not like burning written material. That's all it says. It doesn't really give us any more information. It's kind of cryptic and difficult to understand. However, there are Quranic manuscripts, early Quranic manuscripts, that have clearly burn marks on them that are clearly partly burned. What does that mean? You know, when we think about burning books, right? This is like, is it Bertolt Brecht? You know, when, when they start burning books, they'll soon start burning people. You know, burning books, Nazis, that sounds really negative, right? You burn books that you don't like. Um, so why on earth do we have reports about early Muslims burning, uh, burning books? We have another example of a very early, this is, probably the earliest dated uh, uh, fragment of a Quran uh, from Sana'a, from Yemen, uh, that is probably uh, produced maybe even during the lifetime of Muhammad or just afterwards. Um, and what you can see, I don't know, you, you can't quite see it, but maybe you can guess that there is the main text and then there, is, there are other things like, like ghosts in the background. What that actually is, is that there was an original text that was wiped out and then a new text written on top of it. But this is not paper. Uh, this is parchment. And uh, somebody had written an old text, rubbed out, new text written on top of it. So here this old text was, was used by erasure, washing off, reuse. That's easy to do with parchment. It's, impo well, it's basically impossible to do with paper, right? Uh, but so we have now two early examples I've shown you. One burning one erasure. And both of these examples were from uh, copies of the Quran. And um, that goes back to uh, a very important early historical event in the history of the Muslim community that took place about 20 years after Muhammad's death, which is the unification of the Quranic texts, text, i.e. the production of a uniform authoritative text uh, under the third caliph Uthman, um, who basically put together, the story goes, an editorial team of people to put together one authoritative text that was then copied and sent to the provinces where they served as authoritative uh, texts from which local uh, written traditions were, were then derived. And part of the story, and that's very important, is that after this authoritative text had been established, the Caliph Uthman ordered the, the variant copies, i.e. the non-standardized copies, to be destroyed. And the, particularly the, the issue that's used, that, that is mentioned, is burning. So uh, these copies of the Quran should, were, were burned. What is particularly interesting to, uh, in, in this res respect is that in Iraq, uh, I mentioned to you before these, these three anecdotes, uh, there was this one person who didn't like the burning of, of uh, copies of the Quran. 
he was from Iraq, and we can find this opposition of the, uh, to, to the burning of, of, uh, of the Quran in Iraq in particular. Um, and the, Iraq was a, was a hotbed of, of, of developments uh, of different uh, uh, theological groups, of different legal schools, and all of them developed particular attitudes towards it, but all of them were against burning. So you have Iraqi Shiites and Ibadis, both of them didn't like Uthman as a third caliph. Both of them rejected him. They said, yes, yes, that's what he did. He burned these, these copies of the Quran. That shows how corrupt he was. It's actually one of the big arguments against him. Um, uh, Sunnis in Iraq are people who, uh, who believe that, that uh, the third caliph was a, was a righteous man. They say, yeah, he, he burned it. And that was the right thing. And that's therefore not disrespectful. Right? Why, why do we consider burning a piece of writing disrespectful. That, that was exactly the right thing to do. And then you have um, uh, Hanbalis. They're also Sunnis in Iraq, but they, they come up with a different solution. They say, yeah, well, in this specific circumstance, it was really necessary because to have like variant copies of the sacred text creates confusion. So you had to really finally destroy the stuff and burning was the easiest way to do. But that's not the case anymore. We now have standardized copies, so we don't do this anymore. That was one occasion. We did it. What do we now do with copies of the Quran that we can't use anymore? We bury them. Right? So you have from that original point of debate, the original point of debate of what to do with written material is about what to do with the original copies of the Quran. It goes back all, all the way to this. And from there, you have a specific theorization of, um, uh, of what to do with, with written material. And so um, we have these texts from various uh, uh, authors uh, that theorize what you do with old copies of the Quran as something similar to uh, burying, it, burying them, right? So uh, in the first example, Ahmed ibn Hamal, the great scholar of Baghdad, lived in the, in the ninth century. Um, we have that in the, in the form of a, of a, of a responsum, right? of, a, of a fatwa, of a question. Somebody brought this question to him. Should the Quranic Codex be burned given that it contains the name of God, right? Um, and he replied, to me, burial would seem better. Right, so uh, there's a, a, a clear problem that he has with this. Um, then the, the next scholar, he's a, a 13th century Hanafi scholar. And these Hanafis, they, they had a hard time with this, this, uh, this, um, um, the story of Uthman burning the Quran because they were Sunnis. They, they, they supported uh, uh, what, what Uthman had done, but they felt uneasy with the process, with the practice of burning. Right? And so what they actually did was they developed an argument against the authenticity of this report. So they say, yeah, there are problems with the historicity. We don't even know whether he burned the stuff. Right? So what comes out here is really there's a specific local unhappiness with the practice of burning texts, of sacred texts. That is that, that starts in Iraq, in Iraq and people try to come up with, with solutions. And what this uh, middle scholar comes up with is, is basically a um, a method that is just parallel to Muslim burial. So here there's a, uh, a small insert here I've, uh, I've put on the right hand side about Muslim burial. I don't know whether you're aware of this. Muslims generally don't get buried in, uh, in um, what do you call it in English? In coffins, right? Uh, you, they, they get ro uh, put in a shroud. And then you, yeah, you, you want to like, so what happens? You just put them in a hole and throw earth in them? No, you, you normally have like a little, you, you, you dig down and then you dig to the side. So there's like a little room and this is where the body is put. Right? Either that or you dig down and then you put like a metal, uh, not a metal, a wooden slab on top. So, so like at this angle, so there's a, there's a room created under it, but it's not, the body is not separated by a coffin from the earth, it's just shrouded and buried like this. But even the kind of, if you look at, at the text, it's basically the same procedure of burial is applied to texts. 
uh, in this in this uh, uh, legal manual. And then in the, the final stage here from a 14th century uh, Syrian scholar, again, this is a question. So this is a clearly, you know, people are bringing questions to Muslim scholars. What should we do in this specific situation? Uh, and um, what he answered is, um, as for an old Quranic codex that has been, that has uh, disintegrated to the point that it cannot be used anymore for reading, it is buried in a protected place in the same way that a believer's body is honored by being buried in a protected place. So here, the, the, the analogy is kind of perfectly made, right? It's, these are two are uh, the same things. You, you, um, uh, a worn out text is like a worn out body. You treat a worn out text the way you treat a worn out body. Now, you can look at this um, in different ways. Um, uh, there are different, in different places you have different practices. Uh, um, so yeah, on the left hand side, for example, we have a drawing here of, uh, uh, in Egypt, of the way people uh, get buried there. This is a tomb in Cairo. So this looks much more, uh, okay, Egyptians, you know, uh, uh, leftovers of pyramid, like they still kind of build quite like pyramids uh, for their dead. Uh, they, they direct them to Mecca. They used to direct them to the rising sun, which is basically the same direction. So even the direction is more or less the same uh, as it used to be. But you can see that that this kind of almost looks like a room now, right? Uh, where uh, if you think that that um, that you would you would bury a text like this, you could also think of of putting it in, in, into a room. So what, what, all, all I'm saying here is that the step from the idea of burying text to putting a text in a room that is not used anymore is actually not a uh, is not a dramatic uh, uh, departure. On, on the right hand side, now this is not uh, this is not from the Islamic world. This is from Central Asia, uh, Western China. This is uh, a, a place in a cave where where massive amounts of texts were were found. In fact, we have reports also from the Islamic world in which people deposited old texts in caves and then and then closed uh, the entrance to to that cave. So um, what did um, Muslim culture then uh, come up with as solutions to the problem of, of what to do with text? Well, they didn't come up with a single solution. There are there is kind of um, a catalog of things you can do. Right? So there, is, there are early reports uh, about shredding texts, right? as, as there are today. Um, one way of, of dealing with texts is to shred them. Uh, now, there is a counter argument against this saying, well, imagine you take the word of God and you shred it to, to bits. Right? In one moment, it was the word of God. The next moment, it's just, you know, disconnected letters. That's that's disrespectful. So it kind of becomes it, it it's it's raised up at the, in, in, in early um, discussions. But in later discussions, I it kind of it almost disappears. Second point, again, burning. This goes back to the to the uh, original discussions that the Caliph Uthman burn it if, it, if he did, uh, is that okay? Depends what your attitude towards him is. Um, and then the question whether that's a, what's an actual precedent or whether that was a necessary extreme measure that he took. The next one is washing off. Um, you know, I've shown you this, this uh, palimpsest, this, this, uh, um, this page that was washed off. So, so we clearly have early examples of this happening. Uh, and in later times, many of the handbooks say, yes, that is just the way to do it. That is now, I mean, in, in 14th century Egypt, uh, scholars write, yes, you know, maybe in earlier days, you know, in simpler days, people burn stuff. But these days, all you do is you wash off the text. That's, that's how you do it. Um, but then, of course, you know, you have jurists. Jurists always come up with uh, counterexamples. What do you do with the water that flows off, right? Uh, you have to, you have to, put, you know, you have to, you have to collect that, and what do you do with that then? So it kind of possibly has kind of literally um, uh, problems down the line, downstream problems. And then the final one is burial and storage, um, this kind of analogy between humans and texts. And then the question is, you know, is that actually is that in fact the reason why, you know, the Jewish Geniza is called Geniza? 
uh, in fact, the, the, the earliest uh, connections that we have between this, the kind of between the, the practice and the, and the justification of burying texts is given in the Islamic tradition, not in the Jewish tradition. And these are obviously people who lived side by side, uh, so it is very likely that there was that there was definitely a some sort of crossover in the um, you know a crossover in the attitudes towards written text, in the necessity for um, preserving these texts because you know uh, both Hebrew and Arabic are you know sacred languages. They are languages in which scripture was written. Uh, with all due respect to Shakespeare, uh, English is not. Um, uh, such a language, these you know European languages, uh, you know th these were um, uh, these vernacular languages were secular languages, right? Uh, Latin uh, and Greek were kind of remained as these kind of high languages while while these vernacular languages um, changed. Is that the reason why written materials are are used in different ways? I, I'm not I'm not here to argue this, but um, what I uh, just wanted to uh, uh, convey in this lecture is that there are different ways in which uh, civilizations treat their texts, the way the, the value that it, they assign to these texts, which then opens up questions about what you do with them once you can't use them anymore. And um, um, I hope to have given you a, like a short introduction about how these uh, arguments develop over time, what the evidence is, and shown you some pictures. And um, if you have questions, um, I'd be happy to hear it. Yeah. So if uh, a number of the texts have been buried, or <clears throat> hundreds or thousands have been buried, do we ever find them? Do archaeologists ever find traces of <clears throat> them? And what kind of shape are they in? Yeah, th this is this is a good question. Um, this is a good question because when we find texts, uh, I mean, you know, I, I, I've shown pictures here, such as this one where it says Muslim Genizas. You know, there there was a uh, a trove of texts found in Afghanistan, which was labeled uh, kind of Afghanistan Geniza. Um, you know, we we, we find texts. And then we assume we kind of know what they were necessarily meant for. Uh, so, I mean, there can obviously be different reasons why we find texts buried. And it's, it's uh, you know, they, the, there, there have been massive discussions about, you know, what the meaning of, of, the, of the Cairo Geniza is, uh, because you know, it doesn't have, a, it doesn't have a, a statement at the door that says, the reason why we buried the stuff is for this and this, you know. There's some scholars who say, yeah, oh, yes, the Jewish community want to, want to have an archive of their, you know, communal documents, whatever. They kind of, you know, did they just randomly just throw in any texts? Because, you know, there's sometimes when there's sudden lot of texts we stored there, like in the last couple of centuries, only very few. And then it was closed up. People didn't know anymore what the meaning of this was. So, it, it, you know, we really kind of still trying to reconstruct the meaning uh, the meaning of these uh, the, these burial types, and um, uh, overall, um, um, you know, I've, I've, I've mentioned um, I've mentioned the example from Sana'a in Yemen. I've mentioned the one in, from 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 Damascus. We haven't actually found many of those uh, of these of of these kind of Muslim geniuses in, in terms of comparing it to the amount of of material that must have been discarded or. Uh, so, in turn, I, I can't tell you what the, in terms of quantity, like how much was preserved in these, and why were these things preserved. So, in in in, uh, in Damascus, definitely, and in Sana'a, these were primarily special texts. So, copies of the Quran, very often just fragments, tiny tiny bits, uh, bigger bit, bigger. Uh, uh, um, uh, multi-page fragments, um, all kind of languages, uh, different languages. So things that looked old, I don't know. I mean, um, Can I add Chichila, yeah. 
we do find uh, in archaeological excavations and trash heaps even uh, occasionally sacred text. But as far as I know, um, they're usually not complete, nicely uh, copied books. Uh, they may be just copies, private copies, a piece of paper on which somebody uh, was copying a surah of the Quran, uh, some, some verses. So we do have those, uh, we do find them in archaeological excavations, but they look pretty different. I mean, we, we, we do have, uh, I mean, fr from Egypt, again, um, be because of the climate, there, there are specific kind of papyrus um, um, uh, yeah, f fragments and documents that, that were found. But they were not, they were basically trash. I mean, they were thrown away. They were not kept somewhere. Um, so, you know, the the... the the theoretical discussions we have access to are among elite thinkers. How far that, that trickled down is, I guess, similar to our discussions today, like how many people actually do recycling and how many people just throw stuff away. Um, how many people actually did, did bring these scruples about, about what to do with texts actually into practice and, and made sure that the texts that they didn't use anymore actually did not end up. I mean, I guess, you know, one, one could use them as, 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 uh, uh, as, as fuel for fire, you know. Uh, um, and uh, another way of, of using these, these pages was as um, for bindings of books, right? Reuse of um, um, the, the, the covers of, of books that, that they glued together several, uh, like they had a car cardboard and then uh, glued it together with, with old pages. Uh, here in the Oriental Institute, we have a lot of old bindings of books and people are still finding old uh, documents within these covers because they were, you know, reused by by uh, um, by paper makers and, uh, and copyists, etc. So there, there, there's there is more usage um, than than just kind of retiring text. There were there was there were forms of reuse. Uh, yeah. yeah. So we have a question from the Zoom um, from Ryan Laherd. And he asks, how do you think it happened that some fringe Muslim groups decided it was acceptable to destroy texts, for example, in the libraries in Timbuktu? Yeah, so that there was, um, there was this, uh, these instances of, of Boko Haram, right, um, when they uh, took over parts of, of West Africa that, that, they, that they destroyed texts. Uh, there was a lot of fear at the beginning. It turned out that most of these texts were, in fact, um, secured by the by, by the librarians there. But of course, that's that's part of the you know we have constant uh, uh, you know especially in a manuscript culture in which texts are more rare, in which there are fewer copies of books. Um, that's one of the politics of memory, right? You can there's parts of of your tradition that you can get rid of if you don't like it. Um, <clears throat> when I, when I uh, was a teenager the, during the during the um, um, kind of civil wars in, in the former Yugoslavia, um, uh, w one one policy of uh, one Serbian policy in, in Bosnia was to destroy uh, Bosnian Muslim manuscripts in order to kind of get rid of Muslim mm -hmm. uh, presence in Bosnia, right? it kind of to kind of uproot it literally, right? And that that's one way of of, of uh, uh, kind of iconoclasm of, of getting rid of types of the intellectual tradition that you don't like. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and Kay Heikkinen had an, a question that sort of echoed this. It sounds like it's been answered, but if you wanted to speak any more about instances where deliberate burning of the books, um, rival sects or schools occurred, um, if you wanted to. Share. I mean, that, that, that is that is a form, of course, a form of censorship and a form of public, also public performance of, of getting rid of. Uh, getting rid of, of books. Um, that is, uh, yeah, absolutely uh, the case. Yeah. We, we have a question here. Yeah. Um, how do the practices that you're talking about uh, relative to sacred text apply to civil and or contractual matters? For example, in these Genesis, uh, did you find such contractual documents as deeds, titles, property documents, uh, uh, records of sales, um, perhaps government reports, um, et cetera. And, yes. and how, did the, um, how did the people think about the retention 
of such things as uh, legal documents, land ownership in the ancient world? I mean, the, the simple answer is yes. I mean, we, that, that, that is what, what makes these, uh, these, play, these um, phenomena so interesting, that, that there is you know, marriage contracts and, and sales contracts and rent contracts and some of the most kind of minuscule uh, everyday things you know, uh, that, 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 that exist in there. Um, so that it is very, and, you know, that there are basically no direct discussions on the, like, like you, you look at this and you think, I wonder why somebody thought this was necessary to be kept. Uh, and I mean, you know, on the other hand, I mean, to go back a little bit, um, I helped a, a colleague recently move out of his, uh, his office here at the University of Chicago and, uh, uh, the University of Chicago archives, they archive everything that he, basically everything he gave them. He gave them all his digital notes of all his readings of all, and there's a, yeah, we're archiving everything. Like there's a certain sense in which, you know, originally I guess it's like, okay, you know, we want to maintain, you know, Einstein's diary has to be maintained, but now there's a procedure in place that just sucks up everything. Yeah, we put it, put it on there, anything, you know, who knows, maybe, they, Maybe he has a shopping list or something like this that, that'll, that'll show up there someday. Uh, so maybe that is the reason. Um, I, I found a legal discussion uh, among Muslim jurists, for example, uh, on the question of what do you do that in, in war you capture um, books by the enemy? What do you do with it, those books? Uh, I say, well, if it's in a language you can't read, then you can't sell them. Because you don't know what's in there, you know. Maybe you're proselytizing, you know, for Christianity. You can't, you can't circulate it. Okay, um, then. Well, so th these are Hanafis. They believe you can't burn books. So, yeah, but you also can't burn them because you don't know. Maybe the name of God is mentioned in it, right? Maybe it's. A, I mean, it's a non-Muslim text, but still, if, it, if the name of God is mentioned in it, it doesn't matter if it's Christian, whatever, it's or Astrian, whatever. You still don't want to destroy it. It's still disrespectful. So you first have to wash it off. Then you can burn it, right? So there, there is, you know, you, there, you know, if you think it through, then you can say, oh, or like even if the name of God isn't mentioned, but these are aren't these also the letters that could also spell the name of God? So then you suddenly become very, very careful uh, of what to do with with text. And then if you put into place just archival practices, then you might end up kind of gathering stuff that that was not really religiously you know, relevant to anybody, but for us, of course, we're very grateful to have them. So somebody on Zoom, Carol Shurston Laherd um, asks, I recall that there was some controversy about the particular content of the Quran fragments found in Sana'a. I'm not sure if I said mm -hmm. that correctly. Can you say more about that? Yeah, so there, there was um, uh, the, the, the first uh, time um, these fragments were, you know, received a, a systematic uh, study were by, by a German uh, scholar. Um, I think still in the 1970s, and uh, so he gathered these fragments. He went back to Germany. He he wrote some sort of short and cryptic promises of what he's going to do and what he's found. And then he didn't publish anything for years and years and decades. And people started saying, oh my God, what has he, has he found a, a different Quran? Are there different chapters of the Quran? Is he maybe scared for his life? And you know, it kind of, it, it blossomed kind of all kinds of theories and articles, speculating, whatever. And then in the early 2000s, uh, so the, uh, this um, the picture that I showed here, uh, Behnam Sadri, um, at, uh, at Stanford at the time, um, got hold of um, one fragment that had been found in Sana'a and that was sold by Christie's, I think. Right? So these things, very often international art market gets hold of things and sells them that are uh, maybe not necessarily uh, legal to sell. But anyway, they were sold and um, uh, he managed to uh, to do a, a radiocarbon analysis of it. And, uh, you know, you can read the, the underlying text. Um, you can, you know, with, uh, with ultraviolet light, you can, you can actually read what it, what it says. And, and 
he wrote two articles that are really pathbreaking about this and showed that uh, while it is while, uh, the underlying text is pre uh, is pre Osmanic establishment of the standard text that we have now the the one on top is the one is is the standardized text and uh, he showed that yeah there, there are some variances uh, variances that are you know very much explainable as the way that you know we, we, we have we have um, theories of, of how you know different people copying the same text that change you know the, the variances are not particularly are not particularly dramatic so the the result is the result of the studies that have come out so far is um, that that the variances are really uh, minimal um, and and most of these the fragments from Sana are in fact now available you can even look at them there's a German program called uh, Kalamos or Kalamos um, that are digitizing these and, and just put them freely available online but there there is no I mean for many scholars unfortunately but it doesn't really matter I mean uh, no, there's no smoking gun there's no radical there's no you know uh, uh, no, no radical difference between this, the standardized text and, and these, these, particularly these, these pre-standardized uh, versions. Um, given that uh, the books were buried in a kind of room uh, mimicking the way bodies would be buried, were they ever buried together? Or is there some taboo against being buried with your books? Or? Ah, with people, bearing, uh, people buried with books? There are, um, I mean, uh, I'm not aware of people exhuming Muslim graves uh, that, that the same way that people exhume, I don't know, pharaonic graves or something like this. I actually don't know what, what the, cutoff, the cutoff date is when you can just it's like, oh, I wonder you know, how the grave of X looks. Yeah. Um, I don't know what the legal limit is there, but um, we definitely have reports about particularly writers and poets um, being buried with their books, but it's like normally their own books, like the books that they've written themselves, like their notes. I, I can understand that. I, I don't want anybody to read my notes in my <laughs> reading. <laughs> so the, definitely the university archive is not getting any of this. It's going to get deleted. Um, I'm much too embarrassed about this stuff. But uh, so that, that exists, uh, that phenomenon exists. But I, again, I don't think we have any idea how widespread. What it, what is the oldest copy of the Quran that's in existence now, and and a few more, you know, how how many copies over the centuries, that sort of thing? That I mean, uh, this this might very well be the oldest that that is dated. I.e., not it's not dated in the text, but uh, radiocarbon dating. Um, when you radiocarbon dated, uh, you get like a, a spectrum uh, of time in which it most likely was produced and the kind of most likely production of this is like within a generation of Muhammad's death uh, and and so from the from that generation and the, and the succeeding generation we have what was the last estimate that I, heard? I mean there, there's still a lot of I mean it has only really been in the last 20 years that people have I mean radiocarbon dating was a so you know has become so sophisticated that you can do this uh, you know, you used to be able to do this for very old stuff, uh, and, and you used a, you, need, you needed to destroy a lot of material to do this. The material has, I mean, if you go somewhere, it says, ah, you know, can we burn this <laughs> this page so we can date it? Uh, most people are going to say no. Now you have to have like what is it, a square centimeter or something you need, uh, which is much more doable. But uh, um, I, I think they say like two dozen copies from the first two generations, um, and. Well, they're not full copies, they're like large fragments. Um, uh, but then over time, yeah, I don't, I, I, I couldn't tell you, you know, like what century, how many, obviously more and more, the later you get, I would assume. But uh, it is a, a pretty well um, attested text. Yeah. Non-Muslim texts like the Dead Sea Scrolls, they have been, of course, buried in the Qumran caves for, for Ever, very very long times. Uh, is this an older older burial site, the Qumran caves, than the Geniza? It's older. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. The the Cairo Geniza. I don't know what the oldest document is, but it really starts like in the tenth, eleventh century. 
um, while, uh, you know, I mean, it's at least a thousand years difference. The Geniza is, is a thousand years younger, yeah. And it, it I mean, it, the Geniza still, is it up to 19th century? Does it still have 19th century material in it? So, you know, it goes, you know, again, it has like a 900 year history of the, of the material that it preserves. It needs to be dry and that's why, um, um, yeah, I mean, Ky Cairo is a, has a dry, um, ha also has a dry atmosphere. That's why, um, you know, in many places you, you wouldn't, you wouldn't have that, you know, you, in, in, let's say in, in Indonesia, in like, like Muslim manuscripts in Indonesia, you don't expect them to survive if they're not looked after properly in a, in a um, uh, but yeah, so dry places uh, preserve these, these things much better. Depository in a kind of respectful manner, but exactly what the meaning of it is, that, that is, you know, that, you know there, there is no handbook, you know, unfortunately there's no, you know, handbook for, you know, that, 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 that speaks about this. So we don't have newspapers of the Jewish community talking about, you know, should we keep this up or should we not? Or, and for, you know, so there, there's, there's a lot of, um, you know, kind of trying to understand. And, and that, that's, you know, my way of understanding is here in kind of comparative, in com not just etymological comparative, but, but also comparative practices between obviously Abrahamitic religions that both consider themselves to be, um, uh, um, recipients of a sacred text in a sacred language, maintaining a sacred language, and therefore, you know, valuing sacred writing in a specific way. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, I wonder if you would comment on the uh, comparison that just stood out to me, which was the treatment of the American flag where there's all kinds of instructions and standards as to when a flag gets old and worn and tattered, you have to take it down and treat it respectfully. Yeah. And you, yes, you can burn it, you can bury it, but you don't throw it in the trash. <laughs> and it's just the object. You don't have to worry about, you know, what's written on it or... Yeah. Uh, the, the kinds of uh, issues that you brought up, I think, are complementary. And I wonder if you would comment I mean, on that. No, you're, you're absolutely right. And it's actually very nice. I hadn't thought about it, but it's a very nice analogy um, of um, um, kind of but objects. Used in burials, too. Yeah. Not buried with the person. Oh, yeah. Uh, that, that, that there are objects of, of respect. I mean, you know, you, you have the same, you know. More Semichek. More Semichek. Do they get buried with the, with the flag? I mean, they, they get put on the... Yeah. The flag is usually not, given to the... Yeah, exactly. It's not buried. Yeah. yeah. And it's folded in a ritualized mm -hmm. manner during the, the funeral process. Mm -hmm. And it, it, it's interesting, I mean, you know... Uh, you, know, you have all kind of issues. I don't know. Uh, you know, it's not actually allowed to to have like uh, you know shoes with uh, with a flag on it, and that, that was actually an issue because Nike had a special edition of of, uh, of sneakers with, with the American flag on it, and uh, that is actually an interesting an interesting parallel, um, given how uh, you know so, you know the, you know the United States is a sec is a secular state, but it has these sacred elements. You know, like, you know, the, the Constitution, uh, uh, the, the whole Declaration of Independence, the kind of ritual nature of, of how it's stored and how it's presented to people, and the American flag as a kind of symbolic, uh, in a symbolic language. And that, that, that's interesting, kind of, to, to think about it, uh, uh, that, 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 that each community needs to have certain things that are sacred and that are not, uh, that are treated in specific ways to show to socialize its members into specific kind of values. So yeah, I think I appreciate that. Yeah. From Greg Gosick, he writes, is there any trade in old texts with markets for collectors? 
with different standards for secular versus sacred materials or requirements for preservation as part of national heritage? Yeah, that, that's a big deal, of course. There's um, uh, a lot of uh, Arabic Islamic manuscripts left uh, the Muslim world in the 19th century when European libraries, also American libraries and private collectors became really interested in it uh, until, you know, it's always some point in the 19th century when when uh, Muslim countries uh, enacted laws against that. So there, there is, it, you know, it now become, becomes an issue, you know, it, it's not legal in, mo in all countries I know of to just uh, export manuscripts. But even though, I mean, I'm maybe not meant to say this, but if, if you go on eBay, you can still buy Arabic manuscripts. Um, uh, and it's not quite clear. Pardon? <laughs> uh, well, I mean, it, it's always it, it's always one, one of those questions. Like if you don't and then who else? I mean, you know, uh, both manuscripts and, and, and printed books, you know, rare printed books, etc. Uh, so it's 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 always, uh, uh, you know, wherever there's money, something will happen. Right. Uh, these things will be will be traded. But there are, of course, there are standards. I mean, the way the same way that, you know, archaeological stuff, you can't just excavate stuff somewhere in Greece and then take it home with you. Um, th th there are there are laws for for kind of preservation that that try to um, make sure that these things don't happen. But you know, especially in, in times of war, occupation, etc., this this happens. This still happens, and and of course, you know, the issue now, Yemen, for example, with the uh, the the war in Yemen, uh, a lot of stuff has appeared uh, on the international art. Like there's this art market slash manuscript trade. Um, you know, with, with with publishing, like with with these. I mean, I showed you this manuscript here. Um, oh, sorry, where did I? Uh, this burned one. Uh, that that is that was just recently sold, um, and again, the, you you think that a modern uh, auction house like will have will be able to tell you where the stuff comes from? No, just recently a very uh, precious manuscript, Quranic manuscript from uh, from Afghanistan, uh, was sold um, by a Western auctioning house, and it was basically clear that it was stolen. Uh, in in Afghanistan recently, in, like in the last 10, 15 years, maybe, uh, and it was sold again. So that's uh, um, uh, a continuing problem. But uh, you know, it, it's one of those problems. If you have poor countries and people that are rich are willing to pay for it, it there's always going to be a, a one-way street uh, of of these texts flowing out. Anyway, thank you all of you for coming, and uh, you know. Uh, uh, even if you go for a next lecture at four, at least go for a few minutes outside. It's such a gorgeous weather. Thank you for coming. Yeah. <clears throat>